Testing, one, two, three. Everyone, um, I'm going to get started on time because it's a pretty full presentation. And I'd like to leave some time for questions. Um, I'm Kurt Menke, or if you're on Twitter, you may know me as Geo Menke. And the title of my talk is Adventures of a Solo GIS Consultant Using GIS um, and Phosphor-G. So I'm based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, I used to be an archaeologist. This is actually my second career. So I kind of picked an Indiana Jones theme for this talk. Two things I love, maps and uh, archaeology. So the funny thing about archaeology is that this is what it felt like, you know, Indiana Jones in the map room. And this is what it really looked like, just a bunch of you know, dirty people digging really square holes in the desert. You know? um, so that's a much younger me in the lower left-hand corner in the blue tank top shirt. Um, and eventually, I mean, that was really fun for my 20s, and I loved archaeology. But I decided I needed a real job eventually. Got a master's in GIS and have been doing that ever since. So I now call myself a reformed archaeologist. And um, I've been doing GIS, like I said, for about 20 years at this point. Um, and I've heard a lot of people say this week that this is their first Phosphor-G. Um, raise your hands if this is your first Phosphor-G event. So quite a few of you. Um, I think that's a really special moment. I put together this map of Phosphor-Gs that I've been to and um, with all the little logos. And I've been to almost all of them on this continent since it started. And the first kind of Phosphor-G-ish event that um, I know of is the map server meeting in 2003. And there wasn't even a, a logo for that. So I just put the picture of the group photo from that 2003 meeting up. And this was a really small, intimate meeting. About 125 people, I think, is the official tally for this. And it almost felt subversive to me at the time. Because you know, breaking away from Esri at that in 2003 felt like a really big deal. Um, got to, there were some great workshops by Steve Lime of Map Server and Tyler Mitchell for PostGIS and Frank Warmerdam for Goodle and Ogre. It was, it was great. And um, we were kind of wondering where the Esri spies were collectively at this thing. And that's an, another picture of a much younger me there in the, in the back row at that meeting. So after that, I was hooked. I've been coming to all of these pretty much ever since. You know, the next year we had a nice one in, in Ottawa. And I think the first actual Phos4G might have been in 2006 in Luzon, something like that. I, I wasn't able to go to that. But went to the 2000 meeting in Victoria, which was amazing. And they've just continued to grow and you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this year is another example of a record-breaking Phos4G NA. Um, I've tried to go to most of the Phos4G NAs as well. And um, last year, I decided to go to the first QGIS developer and user meeting in Denmark. So I have this little inset in the upper right um, for, for that meeting in Denmark. And this is the photo from that. And this felt to me a lot like that very first map server meeting. It was small and, you know, really f super friendly. Got to meet the whole brain trust for QGIS. It was amazing. I mean, Anita Grazer and Tim Sutton and Niall Dawson and Matthias Kuhn, all these people that I've been seeing on listservs and blogs for years, I got to meet face to face. Everyone was super friendly. Um, everyone spoke English really well, so that wasn't a problem. And um, I, I would say if you ever have a chance to do something like that, do it. It was, it was a fabulous meeting. And that's a picture, that's me in the little red circle in the back of that meeting as well. And you know, the other cool thing, I was the only American at this meeting. And in fact, there was only two people from North America at it. So it was just a, a really cool experience. So a little bit about what I do. So um, I spent the first 11 years of my GIS career working at a place called the Earth Data Analysis Center at the University of New Mexico. That's where I kind of cut my teeth with GIS. And um, eventually it got to the point where I was you know, a primary producer doing all the, the work. Eventually they started wanting me to manage the budgets for the project I was working on, and eventually he wanted me to start working on proposals. And at the same time, the work was topically getting less interesting to me, so 
I started thinking, well, what do I need you for if I'm doing everything from proposal to final product? Surely if I apply myself, I can make this work. Um, so these days, my two topic areas are mostly conservation and public health. Um, GIS consultancy is the bread and butter of, of how I make a living. Um, I was, it was a progression. I um, started my own business in 2000 when I was still working at the university, and there were eight years there where I was kind of managing a, a gradually growing side business on the weekends and working full time. When I really decided I wanted to make the jump, I was probably in 2007 working two full-time jobs. And thank God I was a little younger because I could handle it. Um, most of my conservation clients are nonprofit conservation organizations that are kind of watchdog groups for the BLM and the Forest Service and agencies like that. Um, so I, I wear a lot of hats, too. Um, I've recently become an author. Last year, I authored Mastering Cugis. And just this week, I um, put out a new book called Discover Cugis that I'll talk a little bit more about. I'm also involved in education, so I teach part-time. Um, 2008, when I went solo, was when the economy hit, so it was a little scary. And so I started teaching just to diversify a little bit, to have multiple streams of income, and discovered that I love it, so I've been teaching ever since. Um, I can't afford to do a lot of teaching because it frankly just doesn't pay much, part-time instructors, but I just do it because it's a way to give back to the community and I really like it. Um, I've also been involved in curriculum development, I'm a GEO for All member, and um, last year I was honored to be nominated as an OzGEO Charter member, and I'm also being paid to be a blogger these days. So a lot of different hats. Um, one of the main reasons I really chose to work for myself was autonomy and self-determination. I really just wanted to have the freedom to work on things that were important to me and work with software I wanted to work with and you know, work with people that I liked and all of that, because life's just too short to be working on things that you don't enjoy. So I've kind of had an a, a intermittent on, ongoing migration to FOSS 4G. My first introduction was in the early 2000s when I was working at the university and we were standing up a lot of ArcIMS web mapping sites. And we started having this problem where we'd come in every Monday morning, all the map services were dead, and we'd have to relaunch them all. And it was just a nightmare. It was not working. You can't have a website go down like that. So we discovered Map Server and started working with Map Server. And not only was it faster, but the stability was crazy. We would stand up these sites, and they would just run like clockwork for years without us even really having to do any maintenance on them. And we were doing a lot of so I spent from 2001 to 2008, um, my main job at the university was mostly um, web map development with map server and sometimes grass as a back end and things like that. Somewhere in there, on 2006, I discovered QGIS. Uh, it was about version 0 0.7, I think, and it was just a glorified data viewer at the time. And But I was interested in it, and so I kind of followed it through the years, and I would always install the new version to see what was happening. Um, this dotted line is kind of the period where I went solo. And so in 2010, um, I began teaching a full semester class on intro to open source GIS and web mapping. Uh, last year, um, I, or 2014, I developed the Geo Academy with some colleagues, and that led to co-authoring Mastering QGIS. And these days, um, QGIS has finally gotten to the point, I, I, I should preface that whereas I used to do a lot of web mapping, these days, just because of the, what's asked of me, I'm doing more spatial analysis and desktop GIS than web mapping. And so I use a lot of QGIS, and that's what I'll talk about mostly in this talk in terms of technology and, and GRASS and Google and Ogre and Postgres and all of those kind of desktop tools. And I'm using those for almost every new project that I take on at this point. So some of my reasons for using FOSS4G. I think you know, the most important one for me really almost comes down to the community. And these kind of range from practical reasons to some that just kind of support my mission and values. Um, but the community of people um, working with FOSS4G is tremendous. 
And um, that's why I like coming to these meetings, because I'm always meeting new people. And I'm frankly in awe of all the people that come to these Phosphor Gs and all the work that people do, because there are some brilliant people coming to these meetings. That, um, it's very humbling. Um, and so that great community is also provides great support. Um, there's really nice access to developers. I mean, I can't talk to Esri developers, but I can talk to um, you know Niall Dawson about some new feature of QGIS and get some really useful feedback. You know, um, and then most importantly, the software works. It's interoperable. It's fast. So this is a photo from that Denmark meeting. Um, some of you may know Jeff McKenna, who is the past president of Osgeo. Um, Lean Fisher's in the middle there, um, who is a professor in Copenhagen who um, organized that meeting, and then Tim Sutton, the head of the QGIS PRC. So it was just so cool to be able to just, you know, rub shoulder to shoulder with these people. So to go through some of the practical um, aspects of QGIS especially that um, I'm a big fan of, there's um, all the database and OGC connections. So you can bring almost every kind of data you'd want in. There's, at this point, I think 42 different vector formats that QGIS will read, 88 raster formats. So there's almost, there's really nothing that I can't bring in and work with in QGIS. Some of my favorite QGIS plugins, there's a lot, but these might be some of the, the highlights. So if you've used um, data-defined values to do label placement in QGIS, there's a great plugin called layer to labeled layer that creates all those attribute columns automatically for you. Um, status and group stats I use a lot for um, creating summary tables and getting stats out of the tables. Um, I do a lot of reclassification of rasters, and so there are some grass tools for that, but there's a really nice plugin called Slicer that's um, really handy for that as well. Quick map services for base maps. Um, MMQGIS has a whole suite of tools, but the ones I I'm most fond of are the geocoding tools in MMQGIS because you can batch geocode a bunch of data. And then QGIS to 3JS is a fantastic plugin for rendering data 3D in a browser. Then there's all the QGIS geoprocessing tools. There's the, all the different providers in the toolbox. You can work with models in the graphical modeler. You can batch process with all those tools. You can batch process model tools. Um, and then there's also, obviously, the, the Python console. And one of the new features of QGIS that I'm becoming a big fan of are project variables. Have anyone in here, raise your hand if you've used project variables yet? No one? This is a really powerful new feature that just came out with 2.12, I believe. And um, you can set them at the layer level or the global level. But one thing I have to do a lot is calculate acreages and square mileages of polygons. So I've simply set up global variables for the conversion factors between square meters and acres, square feet and acres. And now when I open up the field calculator, I can just quickly calculate those numbers using variables. So I make about two to 300 maps a year. I don't really know how that happens, but I've tabulated it recently, and that's what it always seems to come out to. And um, I'm a really big fan of the cartographic capabilities in QGIS. And I get to work with some pretty interesting data because of the organizations I'm working with. Um, this is a map from 2011 that shows the Powder River Basin in orange in northern Wyoming and southern Montana. And then it shows all the coal-fired power plants that coal from that um, field gets shipped to, and all the ports as well. Um, I also love the live layer effects and inverted polygon shape burst fills. So um, I, I have clients that unfortunately want the kitchen sink on a map. And it can be really challenging. They're always wanting multiple polygon layers on top of one another. I'm always explaining it. You can't really do that very effectively. And maybe they need two or three maps instead. Um, but with QGIS these days, I think some of the cartographic effects are really powerful. This is a map of the, the Gila bioregion in southwest New Mexico where the Mexican wolf population is trying to be restored, and it's a pretty rocky program. It's not going so well. And one of the issues is, is year-round livestock graving, grazing and calving operations. And so I'm working with an organization that is working with these grazing allotment permittees to retire those allotments so that there's just fewer cows and fewer chances of depredation out there. And so they wanted to highlight a couple of these allotments um, in 
that are they're working on getting retired on this map. The orange polygon is the um, home range for wolves in the most recent year, and um, so you know it gets a busy map. But the inverted shape versus polygon fill around the bio region causes it to pop off the map a little bit. Then I was able to use some kind of subtle drop shadows on the small allotments in the wolf home range layer that just make it a little easier to get the point across on the map. And one of the interesting things I found is that my clients, they don't care what I use to make these maps. Some of the clients I've been working with for 10 years and I know pretty well and I've explained open source or tried to a few times and it's really just too much information for them. They, they, they kind of think it's neat but they don't really care what's being used. So it's just for me, really. This is another interesting map that I made um, a few years ago. There's a federal agency called Wildlife Services that traps varmints around the western US. And their data had been locked in filing cabinets for years. And we FOIA'd all that data and had some interns enter all of it by county. And then so we could release it onto a map and show this map that most people don't see very often, which is shading the counties by how many animals have been trapped and killed by this wildlife services department. Um, the losing county was Elko, Nevada with almost 18,000 um, wildlife trappings in, uh, in that 10 year period. So one thing I, I don't, you know, I'm always working in usually roadless areas or you know, in areas like that where open street map data isn't so useful to me and I feel like a little bit of an outlier because open street map is really cool but it doesn't usually apply to what I'm, I'm doing. So another um, aspect of my work is modeling wildlife habitat connectivity, or perhaps you've heard them called wildlife corridors. And there's a really powerful open source tool called CircuitScape, developed by Brad McRae at the Nature Conservancy, that's used to model connectivity between habitat areas with, a, with an electrical paradigm, basically, circuit theory. Then there's now a QGIS plugin for CircuitScape that allows you to run circuit escape through the processing toolbox, which is really nice. And this really busy psychedelic map kind of shows the output of a model I ran a couple years ago using circuit escape, which is, uh, this is riparian habitat connectivity. And it's uh, species generic. It's just looking at basically the connectivity of, of you know, taking in surface water. And so the, the brighter areas would have the highest conductance through riparian areas, and the darker purple areas would have the most resistance. And I'm going to have to go through most of these pretty fast. I could, I've actually given like full presentations on some of these projects solo, so I'm just kind of blasting through to give you a taste of some of the things I work on. Um, this was a model I did for this cute little bird, the Vendiers Thrasher, which is, its populations are just crashing in the southwestern US. This is just a, a plot that shows the population decline in the last several decades. And no one is really sure what's driving this, but they're worried that the bird could be completely exterminated from New Mexico in the next couple years if nothing is done. And so New Mexico Game and Fish hired me to model habitat for this bird. And there's a long story behind this, but I used breeding bird survey routes to, um, as the occurrence points, I used an inductive niche model to generate habitat for this. So it was based off occurrence points, and these little red triangles are the occurrence points I was able to mine from the breeding bird survey data, which was by far and away the hardest part of this project. And for this, I used a software called Maxent. It's a maximum entropy model for um, computing niche models for, for species habitat. It's not open source, but it's a freeware package developed by Princeton that you can download. And it's a, a Java-based GUI. And it basically lets you take a bunch of occurrence points and on the right, you can feed it a bunch of environmental variables that you feel are important towards determining habitat for that species. And it's, it, it's been demonstrated to work really well for species with very restricted ranges and for species you don't have a lot of occurrence points for. So it was a really good fit for this bird. And you can use um, categorical or continuous rasters. So some of the inputs are climate-based, like average annual precipitation. Some of them are vegetation inputs, some of them are elevation, slope, those kind of things. And this is the resulting model output where just the, the small um, green and yellow areas would be the most optimum habitat for the bird and the red would be essentially non-habitat. 
And the really cool thing about Maxent is it once it has a bunch of tools for um, indicating the predictive power of the model and the importance of variable contribution to the model, but it'll also let you project that model onto a set of future climate change data once the model has been built. So I did that with some data from PRISM from 2050, which resulted in this, which we were shocked at because the habitat we thought was shrinking. So I think there's a couple things here. One, there's probably more the bird is using to identify habitat with than I can represent in a GIS. Two, there's some other species that are probably out competing this bird. So we actually did um, a model for a curve-bill thrasher to show how that was um, interacting with this habitat. So another aspect of my work is teaching. Um, I really see teaching as a bridge. This is another Indiana Jones metaphor here between the developers and the end users. Because if people aren't teaching FOS4G, then people don't know about it and no one's using it. So I've been teaching FOS4G since, uh, let's see, 2009 was the first time I taught a full semester FOS4G open source class. And um, it's really just exciting. Um, it's, it's fun to turn the students on to this. They're really excited when they realize they can install it on a Mac, first of all, and that it's free. And why is no one talking about this? So you're kind of the usual introductory questions I get. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And I've also, as part of that, been involved in curriculum development. Um, I've developed a full semester class, and then in 2014, um, Dr. Phil Davis pictured here. This is kind of his more normal habitat near a sailboat. That's where he prefers to be. He was our fearless leader for de developing this uh, thing we call the Geo Academy, which is a set of five college courses um, to teach GIS using open source software. So it's more teaching GIS than QGIS or some specific software, but it's using QGIS to teach GIS. And uh, it's all out in the Creative Commons, and so we were kind of thinking, like, we build it, they will come. Teachers can use this and take this curriculum because most people don't have time to develop all this. So we were basically developing this and giving it to people for free. Um, it's based on the Department of Labor's um, GTCM, which is a hierarchical tiered model of the skills, knowledge, and abilities you have to have as a working GIS professional today in today's market. And so it's been vetted by um, dozens of college professors. And um, we were honored to win the GEO for All International Educator Team Award last year for developing this curriculum. And I've also developed curricula for a couple other um, initiatives. So that, that's a lot of fun. And the exciting and very unexpected result of the Geo Academy for me was the invitation from Pact Publishing to author Mastering QGIS. So our whole team co-authored this book last year, which was a lot of fun. And I'll tell you, it's true that when you teach, you learn as much as the students do. It is also true that if you really want to learn software, write a book about it. Because you know we all kind of have our little pathway through a workflow. But you know, you're not paying attention to every little single checkbox on that GUI. And when you write a book, you have to investigate what each one of those things does. And so I learned a tremendous amount, even though I thought I already knew a lot, um, by writing this book. And another benefit of going to that meeting in Denmark was I got to meet one of my co-authors, Dr. Luigi Pirelli. He now works for Boundless, um, but he's uh, one of the core um, QGIS developers as well. So we were also invited to update this book this year because Q just developed so quickly. We're now pretty much done with the second edition of this. I'm trying to figure out from Pact when this will be ready. It's in final production. Um, and so we uh, gave it this nice snazzy cover. Um, of, this is Essen in OpenStreetMap Data, which is the name of the latest release. And it should be due out any day, and I've been saying that for a while. Um, in reality, it might not be out for a month or six weeks, but look for that soon. It's updated to the latest version of QGIS, and it has some new chapters of additional material. Another shameless plug. So um, I was also invited by Locate Press, which is run by Gary Sherman, the um, inventor of QGIS, um, to publish the Geo Academy curriculum as a workbook. So I worked over the winter on that. Um, 
It was basically just a matter of formatting it into a workbook, and I also updated it. So it's now the most up-to-date version of the Geo Academy curriculum. Um, it works with um, QGIS 2.14, GRASS 7.03, and Inkscape um, are all components of this curriculum. So this is all five college classes, all as a workbook. With each one has challenge exercises, study questions, and things like that. And right now, if you go on to Locate Press, it's available as a preview edition because we still have some formatting tweaks to make to the book. But you can download it as a PDF. The list price is going to be $36. Right now, with the FOS4G NA coupon code, you get a 50% discount. And you'll be eligible for the final release when it's ready in a few weeks. So another aspect of my work is um, working on this contract with the National Library of Medicine where we're working to empower um, public health groups and communities working with underserved populations. And um, we have a blog as part of that, communityhealthmaps.nlm.nih.gov, and there are some resources there. And we've worked on case studies, and so we've worked on quite a few for example, we've been to, to Hawaii and worked with Native Hawaiians and helped them map their native knowledge of winds and rains and some really cool th work with obesity data out there. We've been to Seattle and showed some people up there how to map noise pollution in, in, in uh, Indian neighborhoods, all mapping their neighborhoods with their smartphones and using QGIS to make maps and CardoDB as well. And then Charleston, South Carolina most recently, we've been down there several times and taught them how to do the same thing, and one of the highlights was going to this high school on one of the sea islands outside of Charleston and showing these women over their lunch break how to use fulcrum in their phones to collect data, and they picked it up like that. It was a lot of fun. And then they spent the rest of the semester mapping their island, and um, so it's really exciting to turn people on to this technology that wouldn't normally know about it or have access to it. And so some of the challenges of switching to FOS4G. Um, this is what it feels like sometimes to me. Um, first of all, I have thousands of MXDs on my, I've been doing GIS for so long <laughs> that I have just a lot of work that is in MXD format that would be, I'd love an MXD to QGIS converter, you know. I often have clients that require an Esri Geo database or an Esri model as a deliverable, which I can't do. So this is an example of one of the models I'm talking about. I'm working with the Wilderness Society right now on this massive Esri model. This is actually a model that has two dozen sub-models in Model Builder that took a couple people a year to create. And it takes a National Forest Road data set, bangs it up against a whole suite of environmental variables, uh, takes a couple hours to run on a National Forest data set. It identifies routes that could be candidates for decommissioning, and then it ranks those according to those environmental variables. And, um, it's just not worth rebuilding the wheel. So, you know, one of the things you have to realize is, you know, when to use the right tool, right? And there are very, very rare functionality issues. Um, one of my uh, issues right now that I've told some people about is support for raster attribute tables. There's some categorical um, raster um, data that I get, as, such as land cover or vegetation data that have multiple attribute columns and I can't access that in QGIS or GRASS, I don't think. I've found out that maybe I can work with it in R or Postgres, and so I need to look into that. But I've submitted a, a feature request to QGIS for this, and so hopefully one day that gets answered. So go to help resources. Um, I think one of the coolest things now is that this is my one part of my bookshelf. There are so many books out there now. Um, and I want to thank Gretchen Peterson and Anita Grazer for making cartography cool again with their new um, QGIS map design. Seems like cartography always kind of was kind of poo-pooed, and now everyone's really into it, and I think that's cool. Um, so I also, you know, follow GIS Tribe on Twitter, um, a Twitter meetup every Wednesday. There are, um, which is a lot of fun. I use Twitter a lot to keep up with latest developments. I go to blogs like Anita Grazer's and Niall Dawson to follow QGIS updates, and then there's also, you know, GIS Stack Exchange, and of course, all the listservs that you can answer questions with, and I find people be really helpful. So what's next? Well, there's always the challenge of being current and learning new tools, and I find this to be very difficult because I don't have a lot of spare time. 
So I might really want to use R, but I have to figure out a time when that fits into my schedule. So I really need it to be something that I can see a direct application to on a project I have going on. And I, I don't always know enough to be able to figure out that application. And so I kind of just put it on the back shelf and hope that someday in August I'll be able to get to it or something like that. Um, another thing that I'm going to be doing is um, I'm working with some lawyers on a, there was a big forest fire in New Mexico and um, I'm working with some lawyers who helped an Indian Pueblo sue the Forest Service for damages from this fire. And I'm going to be an expert witness in a trial this fall to defend some of the exhibits I created, which is going to be a new experience for me. Um, I'm also going to be working on a mountain lion habitat model across all 11 western states, which is going to be a big challenge. Um, I know there's a lot of state agencies wanting to migrate to open source technology. I'd like to assist them in that, but I haven't really found the opportunity quite yet. And obviously attending more Phosphor G events is always high on my radar. So some closing thoughts. Um, one thing I've been thinking about is I, I've, I've forgotten as much as I've learned. There's the technology in the last 20 years I think has switched over at least three separate times in my career. I, I used to be an awesome avenue programmer, and who cares anymore, you know? Um, so don't be afraid of new tools. You just have to keep current. It's part of the exciting part of being involved in GIS, just that rapid pace. Um, I think also GIS is a tool, and you have to have a niche. I get about a letter a month, an email a month, asking me someone would like to pick my brain about how they could do what I do, and I don't have a formula for it. I don't even really know how I've made this business of mine work, but I think one thing is having a niche. You know, like mine is conservation. Another thing is being easy to work with. And so I, um, I know that I've, from people who told me that I've gotten, I've gotten work because people find me easy to work with. And so, like for example, I have clients that have an internal GIS shop and they find it easier to contract with me and faster turnaround than to work with their own internal people. So that's another thing I, I like. And um, self-employment is a balancing act like we all, we all have. There's a lot of things to keep current. So you have to be a multitasker. But I think there's a lot of more important, important work yet to be done. So if, you're, if this sounds exciting to you, I encourage you to do it. And so with that, I can take any questions you might have. The question was, have I um, customized an interface or customized QGIS in any way for, for clients? And I, I haven't done that. Um, at, the, at the moment, I'm providing resources directly, maps and analyses. I, I, I used to create custom ArcView applications for people. I've done that in the past, but I'm, I'm not doing that currently. But it would be fun to do. Do you hire subcontractors? Yeah, the question was, do I hire subcontractors? And I do often. That's one of the things teaching has benefited me. You know, I always know the the um, rock star students that um, need work. And so I've, I've used students like that several times and collaborated with colleagues occasionally. It's a good question. The question is how how do I balance, um, you know, the coming to Phosphor G and working for clients that don't maybe not have deep pockets and things like that. And I, um, you know, honestly, I, I've done some pro bono work, but I, I um, basically, if, if the client doesn't have money, most of the time I can't work with them. But I, I work for nonprofits, and so I have a very reduced rate. I'm pretty cheap for my experience level. I think um, I have a, a sliding scale depending on whether it's a a for-profit or a non-profit organization. Um, coming to events like this is very difficult for me. Um, I put this on a credit card, you know, I'm going to have to pay it off. Um, so I'm, I'm both not making money and have money going out. So it's, it is very difficult to come to these and I have to pick and choose which ones I go to. Um, but you know, I, I've done very well. I don't, I'm not getting rich, but I'm comfortable. And so it seems to work.
The question was, was you know, is it, what's more important, a, a, a niche or I guess using the just the technology and hanging out a shingle? And I, I think, I mean, from personally, I think it's important to have a niche. Um, I, I built that up over eight years before I went on my own, and I had, I knew I had a stable of clients that I could work with, and I also had knowledge about the area that I was applying it to. So I'm not a biologist by training, but I've learned a lot about ecology and conservation over the years because that is what I do. And so I'm an expert in those. I know where to get the data quickly, and I know some of the issues with mountain lions or national forest road data sets and things like that. And that is so I, I'm able to apply my knowledge in that way. And so I think if you I think that's something that's important to develop is is an, an interest or an area that you're going to apply the tools to. All right. Well, thank you, everyone.